Yeah. 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 Well, we can certainly okay. talk about it afterwards if we don't catch it during. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and good evening to Mandy, uh, all the way from UK. <laughs> um, so I, my name is Cheranal Lur Vasudev, and I'm from IBM, working in the Global Chief Data Office, and I have a general interest in uh, data governance and data monetization and so on. And very, very glad to be uh, the moderator for this session here. And um, as you know that uh, data is the most valuable asset, as everybody has agreed. And the, it becomes valuable only when it is properly managed and curated and governed and, and made it available to the right people at the right time. So that's all about the data ops. I mean, we'll hear from all the experts here. Um, so and also when the data is very much uh, distributed, uh, Typically, when in, uh, in this new IoT world, 80% uh, of the data will be generated uh, will be by the devices, not by the humans or transactions and so on. So the, the distributed governance of data becomes all the more important. There's a lot, lot of challenges in terms of securing and making sure it is trustworthy and so on. So we, here we have a very distinguished panel here. Uh, let me first introduce them. Uh, right to me uh, is uh, David Radley. Uh, David is a Nigeria maintenance, uh, maintain, maintainer at IBM UK, Hersley Lab. He has over 30 years of experience in IT with uh, at least 15 years in information management. And in his role, David promotes and develops information architecture uh, to underpin analytics and metadata-driven solutions. And he spent, has spent a lot of time in the Apache Atlas Committee and is now the next foundation maintainer for Nigeria. So very experienced person. Uh, he also leads uh, events in Nigeria in, as a, with the senior leadership team and um, very active in the LFIA Foundation here. So, well, welcome, David. Hello. And here we have Dan Wolfson, uh, founder of Pragmatic Data Research Limited. Uh, is a cons uh, Pragmatic Data Research Limited is a consultancy specializing in accelerating digital transformations through innovative data architectures and governance. Uh, Dan uh, retired from IBM as a distinguished engineer and director and CTO in the Weather Business Solutions Group uh, of IBM AI Applications, where he led applications of geospatial data and analytics to multiple areas such as environmental intelligence, agriculture, and utilities, and so on. Uh, he has over 35 years of experience in um, research and um, commercial distributed um, research and commercial distributed computing, ranging from transaction management of data oriented systems and so on. He has numerous papers to his credit, co-author of Enterprise Master Data Management, uh, Beyond Big Data, and many others too. Uh, he is also a member of the IBM Academy of Technology, IBM Master Inventor, uh, and uh, several uh, patents to his credit, and he's also been recognized in ACM and ACM Distinguished Engineer. So, welcome, Dan. Thank uh, you. And uh, we have a uh, distinguished remote participant here, Mandy Chisel, uh, through joined us through WebEx. And Mandy, special thanks to you. Um, we had some emergency earlier. We had another panelist, and, and Mandy really, uh, you know, was generous to join here at this late hours, uh, evening hours for her. And Mandy also worked for IBM uh, for 35 years, and the last 15 years as IBM Distinguished Engineer. And she is now one of the founders of the Pragmatic Data Research Limited. Uh, her focus has always been using and supporting open standards to achieve heterogeneous interoperability. Uh, he was, she worked on the CORBA standards, uh, as well as uh, the OASIS and an open group. Uh, Mandy is also a leader in the con contributor to the Nigeria Open Source Project. Uh, she is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering and is a distinguished as the first woman to win the Royal Academy of Engineering Silver Medal. So uh, welcome, Mandy, uh, to this panel. Um, and also, since we have only a few people here, we have got five, if we can count, maybe we, should, we, should, we can promote you all to the panel and then maybe go around and introduce yourself and then make, it, make this panel or discussion more interactive. So if you want to introduce, have a quick introduction for yourselves and then uh, what your interests are, that will be helpful for the panelists to answer the questions appropriately. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Sarah Griffin, and I work in the Chief Technology and Innovation Office at Dell Technologies, and I'm an engineering technologist there. But I was a math teacher for 10 years before joining Dell. Cool. Hello, my name is Marco. I'm a professor at Northern Arizona University, and I'm here because I'm proposing a research that uh, uses chatbots to improve the quality of the code written to analyze data. So I want to get some insights. I'm Kieran. I work at a consulting firm in DC uh, doing like AI and analytics stuff. And I just wanted to learn a little bit what y'all are talking about. <laughs> I'm Kelly. I'm a solutions architect at Databricks. So I work with Databricks customers to help design architectures for their data. Um, I'm also the next speaker in this room about Data Lake, so I like learning about what everyone else is talking about, so looking <laughs> forward to this. Yeah. Excellent. My name is Josh Mitchell. Um, I'm a software engineer. I work for the Department of Defense, um, and, uh, or the DOE, but on Department of Defense work. Um, and uh, I recently acquired a data team, so maybe like last couple of years. So there's been this uh, evolution that we've been going through, so I'm very curious about strategies. I'm Lawrence Hecht. I do a lot of things, but I also work on the Linux Foundation research team, and I've been an advocate for open data forever, and I really want to move the ball forward with get, having uh, industries collaborate more on metadata standards. Yep. Right. Well, thank you all. Um, so let's start with some of the basics. Uh, and I would like to hear from the experts here. So what, what do you, what, in your view, what, is, uh, what, what do you mean by data ops? We'll start with uh, David. Sorry, Dan. Okay, okay. <laughs> so um, to me, so actually, let me, um, back up a little bit. One of the jobs that I had um, was, uh, was not only was I CTO of an area, but I was also the development director for an area. And I had data engineering teams under me. Uh, and we did everything from, from how do we find the data to how do we manage the data, how do we build analytics over the data, provide the analytics as products that we actually sold and people consumed as products, right? And so if we think about that whole evolution, that whole life cycle, and how we manage that life cycle, uh, to me, that's a lot of what the data ops is really about. How can we bring some automation to that practice? How we bring collaboration to that practice? And how can we be efficient about that practice? And, and there can be a lot of trickiness that, that, that comes into play here. And it's not just about the technology. It's about the process. It's about the organizations. It's about the structure, about how we foster the right kinds of collaboration and communication often through tools, but not exclusively through tools, in order to handle these kinds of things on a daily basis. And you know, when you're in operation with this, once you're through that life cycle and you're in operation, things happen. <laughs> the world doesn't stay static, right? And so in my particular case, for example, we, we would pull in data, light for, data from a number of satellite systems around the world, right? And we built that out of geospatial data. It's terabytes of data, petabytes of data. Well, what happens when one of those satellite systems, one of those data delivery systems that one of the governments has, fails, right? What do you do? How do you, how do you find the other data? Well, that's part of the whole data ops process, is building the resiliency in your process to be able to continue to deliver your data, your service to your consumers with the least amount of interruption and at a reasonable cost and, and happiness to everybody involved. Thank you, Dan. So that gives a very, very good perspective about how we can bring the results to the, the data ops itself. Yeah. So David, do you have anything more to add or maybe, maybe refute any of these? I, I'm not going to refute any of them. It sounded very reasonable. I think I mean, the only additional thing that I was to say that the agile methodology seems very important um, to bring from into using it with data. Um, so we're looking about operationalizing data so that you get a handle on its quality 
And this is all about the procedures, uh, the processes, and the, as well as the technologies and the people that come into play to make, to bring, to, um, to make this happen. So there's a cultural element to this as well. And the, uh, the processes whereby the people interact with it need to be agile so you can make quick changes. Um, when the automation, um, it, it hopefully solves a lot of the problems. The people need to be involved as well um, to uh, solve those out of line situations. So finding that balance between how much you can automate and uh, how dangerous it might be if you over automate um, is quite uh, an interesting situation. Yeah, that's another good point about scaling and how you can accelerate the whole process here. Mandy, uh, over to you. Uh, do you want to bring in some perspectives here? Um, I, I, I think those are t um, two sets of important points. I'd also add that data on its own is uh, not useful until it's processed. So one of the other things we need to think about is how the data as it's being turned into a product is then consumed by analytics and also brought into production. So we have DevOps, which is focused very much on that link between developers and um, operations teams. And then we can also think of data ops as bringing the data scientist lifecycle into this production development type process. So you've, got, you've still got the distinct life cycles, the distinct tools that are part of it, but it's about bringing those teams together so that they can do their, their thing with their tools, but also uh, the exchange, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the result is a system that is a good balance of the data, the, the analytics and the, uh, the rest of the systems that, that operate around it. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, we brought about the keyword DevOps, so that takes us now my next question. David, uh, would you differentiate how the DevOps and data ops, where they match, where they don't? So uh, DevOps. Um, DevOps is um, uh, around um, how you deliver applications in the developer's um, world. And data ops is the, the emphasis around data uh, with data science, um, analytics, models, the, all of the processes around that. So both of them seem to have in common agility, so the, the agile methods. Um, so I think that's probably the, the way that I differentiate between, um, between them. Any, any other um, thoughts? Uh, Mandy, do you want to add on to that? And then I'll jump in afterwards. <laughs> um, I, I think the... I think the aims are similar um, to, to actually uh, take some of the, um, uh, of the risk out of uh, the, ex uh, the handover of work from one team to another. Um, but it involves very different tools and different skill sets and different, different types of professionals. So uh, I think overall they need to operate together, um, but, but there will be different technology involved um, and also different cultures around the pieces that are coming together to build, uh, you know, the system that's combining data analytics and uh, um, traditional software. I think that what I would add is, um, or really expand on, is the difference between kind of data engineering and infrastructure engineering. Uh, and where data engineering and data science in my mind is really a continuum. Most data scientists are doing some amount of data engineering. Many data engineers are really doing some amount of data science. And, and it's that you're really working with and in the data, and it's not just about programming. It's not just about code artifacts. It's actually about looking at the end result of what's being produced and making sure that it's consumable by the users that need to consume it. Right? And, and that's a little bit different from the way we think about DevOps, which is deploying out large amounts of infrastructure, keeping it up, keeping it up and running. But it's not thinking about, it's not the, you know, the equivalent there would be to say every application is tailored for a particular small set of users, and we have to tailor, rewrite the application for each. Whereas in data ops, when we start to think about data as a product and other things, we have to think about, okay, are we producing something that is consumable? How do we need to transform it? And we can continue to refine the data itself 
in order to continue making it better and better and more usable by this particular community, right? And so it's an ongoing process of refinement in many cases, as well as being able to deal with all the resiliency issues, all the scalability issues, and the cost issues that we have to deal with. Okay, very good. So, I mean, we are all good at coming up with the new terminologies and, and now coining the other things, uh, coining new, new, new ways of thinking and so on. So, I just want to ask you, um, how does the data ops and data governance, you now they, they fit together? Are they one of the same or how much they differ? Uh, well, I, that? I don't see them exactly as the same. Mandy, I think you had a, a term that you had been toying with around this. You want to... <laughs> I'm not sure which term you're talking about. Uh, Sorry. Data GovOps. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, I mean, data governance is so much more around the culture and the way the organization thinks both strategically and operationally. So it, it's, it's a much bigger deal. Uh, data Ops, we're looking at um, the, the, the production of data for certain tasks and things. So um, you... You know, it needs to fit in the data governance program. It's probably, you know, in the same way as all the users of data. But uh, it, it, it could, it, it provides a mechanism where um, some of the data governance program can be automated. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You have a question, please. Uh, so I've written a bunch about ML ops, uh -huh. and basically where it's, I've written a lot about, or somewhat about ML ops and where in CI, CD mm -hmm. for data ops. Mm -hmm. Is that basically somewhat what we're talking about here? It can be related. I mean, when you want to do machine learning, you need to be preparing very large, wide data sets typically mm -hmm. for that. And the process of preparing those data sets is usually part of a data ops operation, mm -hmm. right? When we get into ML ops, it's not only about being able to right to build out those algorithms and do the training but it's also about how do we transition that from just the machine learning part the model part into something that's production worthy mm -hmm. and there's a very close relationship there between the data ops and the ml ops traditionally mm -hmm. and the reason and, and there's actually a couple tricky points around that um, so one point is on just the pure ml ops side you want to typically look for bias. You want to look for other factors that could be influencing that, and you want to make sure that, that the data that you're using to do your training on is allowing you to build an unbiased model result. Mm -hmm. The problem with both, when you start to look at scaling up, is that the data sets that you have available may not be the same. So let me give you a concrete example. Um, we built a, uh, a model for predicting crop yield of a particular kind, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and there's a lot of different ways of doing crop yield. It doesn't really matter. But if I tried to build a crop yield model and I do it in the small and I do it with, a, you know, from a couple of growers worth of data and they happen to be in the Midwest of the US and I build this wonderful model that's superbly predictable for, for what they have, and now somebody from India comes and say, can I apply your model to my, to my fields in India? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not gonna work because the data is completely different, right? And the data itself, which we're training against, there, you, know, you have to think about how do I scale my data to cover the use cases my tar that I'm trying to target, the scalability, where, where the ML ops is often limited and, and, and often doesn't, in my opinion, think about the, the restrictions and constraints that the training set is providing in order to produce the model result. Does, does that make sense? What you mean is not dealing with the, tra the um, restrictions? This restri so when you tra if you're training a straight ML model, mm -hmm. then the, the, your model is limited by the set of data that's available in the training, Okay. right? So if I'm training for North America and suddenly somebody gives me India, and even though it might be the same factors, it may be temperature and you know, NDVI and, and how much water is available and the variety of crop and whatever else, even though the factors are all the same, the fact that it is in a different part of the world means that the actual processes might be different, right? And that combination of factors, even though they're all the same elements of data, when I apply them between this part of the world and that part of the world, I get a different answer, 
the model's different. And so when we do ML ops, and this is also how it relates to data ops, we need to think about what is the scope of the data set and to acknowledge that the training that we're doing is valid within the scope of the training set, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when I'm trying to scale it, if I try to scale it beyond what the training set constraints are, I can't guarantee that, that I'm going to produce a good answer. And that's what, that's and that's, what that's a combination of ML of ops and data testing, ops. That, that, that needs to be, that's, that's that needs to be the interaction, that's exactly, yes. Yeah. yes. That's part of the scale up process. And there is one more aspect we can add uh, would be that even if it is the same environment, there is a model drifting, to be, we call it. That's, because, yeah. that, yes. that's another, that, and yeah. that's another, yeah. another one so over what time. What we do, yeah. now one of the examples in our organization is that we used to build these models every month. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a we, we could, ideally we should build every, every day or every, every week because the data is changing every day, right? Even for the same environment. So that is much different from the software. Software, once it is built, the same level of accuracy is assured, you know, uh, but the, the, since the model is based on the data and the data changes almost every moment, uh, we had to re, uh, re refresh these models. So that's one of the aspects of this um, model, uh, or MLOps, actually. Of course, then there is other aspects. It's both, both MLOps and data ops. It's together, right? It's yeah. just, you know, which hat do you want to put on? Yeah. <laughs> So, so that kind of brings into uh, the next question when we say that, how, where do we start for the data ops in an organization? Who wants to take that? Okay. Um, so the way we found is, um, has worked quite well is because we're talking about big ideas, um, they're often, you can try and boil the ocean, you can think very large and um, get nowhere. And you can work for a long time on these sort of projects in the governance space, in the master data management space, and, and get nowhere and have and many for projects fail. And the way um, that we found is successful is to be very um, tight on what you want to achieve, have a very small gain showing the process that you want to, to prove, and have a, a very invested stakeholder around the business such that they can see after something like a small number of weeks or months that no longer than that that they can show business value after say three four months such that they can then say we can move to phase two and get the next small chunk you need these quick wins otherwise um, people get bored they won't realize um, all the value this wonderful value that we're talking about it might not ever happen there be, but you need those quick wins along the way, which is where the agile side is very important to allow you to do that. So um, working in that way uh, allows you to start small, prove what you've got, and then build on it incrementally. Yeah. Man, do you want to add anything? Do you want to, where do we start that ops in your organization? Any advice? Yeah, I think it is important to start with something that, that's going to matter to a stakeholder. So it does need to solve a real problem. Um, the other thing is, though, the danger of, of starting small and keeping small is that you never, you have no path to go beyond that first model. So you do also have to think, what is the end goal? What, am, what are we really trying to achieve? And then very carefully, think about the cultural impact, because often getting the technology right is the simple piece. Um, but a lot of, um, because people are, they're restricted in what they can do by the shape of the organization. And so they're like they're in a box, but that box gives them security. And so as you start to change people's processes and procedures and tools, they feel insecure. So you have to have a program that's not only just doing the technology, proving the business value, but is taking people on that journey and showing them that they are, they have a place in the future. Uh, otherwise, you're really not going to get any any cooperation in, in in the process. Yeah, I think I think that's very true, and it's a really important point that you know when you make changes, you have to provide the safety and the culture around that to support those kinds of changes. I think well, when we step back and think about where do you start, one of the important things, and, and we've all kind of said this one way or the other, 
is to say, where can I demonstrate some new value? Where, where, so if, you know, if I have systems and they're running just fine, then is there value in trying to apply new practice to those systems, right? If I have some systems or I'm building some new systems or I'm doing some new innovation work and, and I need a way to do that in a, in, a, in a structured way that allows me to do that quickly and also where I'm able to take some risk uh, because it's new, right? And I don't have to follow the same established processes necessarily. That's a good place also to start, right? And so innovation and th thinking, thinking through the innovation life cycle uh, and how to do that. But uh, again, coming back to a key point, you need to have the support of the organization and think that through, and you have to provide that, that safety. And that's sometimes why it's good to do it in a project that also is recognized as, as being one that is intentionally maybe higher risk, right, and higher reward. That's okay. Yeah, so starting, what I, what I heard from you both is that starting small is good as a proof of concept, but I think that once you scale up, the problems can be different, and right. maybe there are some risks involved. Right? Yeah, I, I, that, that, that's true, but if we think about the innovation life cycle, uh, so let me just spend a minute talking about the innovation life cycle, the way I think about it, because I think it's relevant, which is, you know, we start with incubation projects. We start with an idea, we start with some incubation projects, we look at to get some validation around those incubation projects, and then we start to scale them up, right, in different ways. And that may, that process may require re-engineering what we're doing, right? So, I mean, what what works in the smalls doesn't necessarily automatically going to work in the large. And so, you part of what you want to do is fail fast. So, so you may have a great idea, and the incubation project says, you know what, it's not going to actually scale, uh, and and that's good. So now you move on to the next incubation project. Right? And the same thing with the DevOps. If you start to apply it down at the incubation project, and, and then it gives you a way to learn, right? And learn what's going to work for you and for your organization. And if it doesn't work, that's okay. Move on, change, and keep going, right? And, and so it's about the innovation process as well uh, and, and, and the people involved and giving them that, that normal way of thinking that, you know what, failure's okay, we'll just do the next one. We, there's, there's no lack of work. There's no lack of interesting ideas. We just need to keep moving forward. Yeah. Yep, question. So, um, so scaling, one of the important parts of scaling is that you can, um, in order to prevent, I would think, over automating is that you know when things are failing Yes. So our team has um, been working. We, we're using Airflow mm -hmm. in combination with Great Expectations. Mm -hmm. We're starting on that journey. Uh -huh. um, I think it seems that in terms of automated data testing, that there's, at least from what I saw, there wasn't a lot of emphasis placed on tooling to do automated data testing, um, at least not at, and in my like looking around, um, Great Expectations was a, a fantastic tool for that. I didn't seem to feel like there was a lot of support around that. Maybe I'm wrong. Your face is saying that maybe that's not true. But can you talk about how the open source community, like some of the bigger projects, similar to that are like what those are? Yeah. So um, I don't know. Of, I guess I have two quick points. One one point is is that quality is in the eyes of the consumer. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, what's good quality for one project and one use may not be good for another, right? And, and, and so, it, while it's important to, to, you know, set a baseline, you know, like I don't want to accept any nulls of this kind or whatever it's going to be, right? You know, there's some things that are generally very clear, but a lot, once you're past the kind of, a lot of the basics, then then you're into more nuanced kind of uh, quality metrics that you're going to be doing. Uh, so that's just kind of one, one, one quick thought. Um, I haven't personally seen as much open source quality work uh, around that. Maybe, Mandy, you have. I don't know. You, you've more experience there than I do. No, no, I would, I would agree with that. I think there's, there's a lot of people writing pipelines um, and uh, a lot of people writing training tools for, for um, different types of analytics. 
uh, but much less on the, the, the basic quality tools. So, um, yeah, I think it, the, the really good sort of discovery and quality tools tend to be um, vendor products. Yeah, maybe a thing we were discussing earlier, uh, David. Uh, so, what are the things that are missing in data ops? And we are talking about some of the issues now. Is data ops complete, or is mm, what what are the major issues in process and technology and tools? I don't know if it's complete. Um, I'm not quite sure what we were talking about with this. It's um, I know we were we were talking about. Um, if we automated everything and we left it up to the computer to do everything, um, that we could end up in a big problem. Like they, there's algorithms in the bank that go sell, 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 and you haven't got any money left because it, um, it gets one of those sort of micro crashes that happens um, a lot. So there's this, there's this balance between um, automating as much as you can, but no more, and having a, pr a proper human oversight for those places where it's required, so that you have a, a good um, uh, control, an element of control as to what you're actually, um, what your processes are doing, and they don't, um, and they don't, and you notice when they go off board. So you need the metrics in place to be able to spot the alerts in place to be able to spot when they're um, when they're going off off. Um, off records such that the the, um, the people can get involved, the humans can get involved and rectify them. Yeah, I mean the the term is often management by exception, right? <laughs> you want you want people, you know, where you right. want to set your thresholds and then look for where the exceptions are and then figure your comfort level for where your trigger points are, as when you do your statistical process control on on that and then then turn that into a human action. Um, in many cases. Yeah. Thank you. So. Uh, Covering some of the basics, although there are more to discuss there, let's switch gears and then bring the open source topic to the data ops. Uh, so how can open source uh, help, uh, open source and open appro approaches can help in the data ops? Um, so we're, we're um, I'll, I'll say them, that I'm a maintainer on the Ageria project. And um, Ageria is a way of, um, solving the problem where we have um, silos of data which are varying quality and, and varying um, different vendor um, formats, uh, different technologies, different types of data. So the Ageria um, allows you to map into a, a common open set of types that represents these things. And in the Ageria ecosystem, you can then get a view across your data um, so instead of saying, give me all your Oracle databases, you could say, give me all your assets or give me all your glossary terms that could come from all the various different places. So I see that coherent way of um, getting access to the data and being able to then govern and classify appropriately at, first of all, at the, those um, capability levels, the open type levels, but also if you want to actually have a semantic um, layer on top and uh, govern at the semantic layer, having glossary terms that um, you know that are what a customer is, such that uh, and and the various attributes that make up your customer in your glossary, such that you can map it to the database um, uh, columns, the event fields, the API fields, all of which that would might rep represent the same, say, national insurance number of a customer. That way seems to be a very solid way to underpin um, su such an operation if you want to be able to get a view across all of your data um, via the metadata, a standardized open metadata. Um, Ageria is, um, has very solid core layers and we're build out, building out on certain access, um, access sort of uh, ways of doing it for, for different tools, different use cases, different personas. There's a lot of scope for the community to come in and for us to come together with your use cases and join us um, in, uh, in Nigeria and other projects. So another project in this um, area that seems to be doing a very similar thing um, is um, the op open lineage. When I say a similar thing, it's producing an open standard that many projects can produce lineage in. This idea that lineage, uh, how, where, where things have come from, so you can look in a report to see um, where did this actually come from, what systems did it flow through, 
that um, is very important to many organizations, especially our banks and financial institutions, that that's often the big driver for a lot of this activity. Yep. Mandy, anything you want to add? No, I, th I think, um, you know, David's point that open source allows companies to work together on integration and standards that are difficult for a, for a particular vendor to push and get adoption across the industry. So I think uh, we are, we're good at standards, we're good at, at getting companies to collaborate on key points where their things need to work together. Um, and also writing the code that everybody needs but really don't dif doesn't differentiate um, in the market. So it's, it's, so for us the metadata repository is very expensive to build. Uh, everybody needs one. <laughs> Open source is a good way to share the cost of providing those. Connectors is another area. Uh, so I, I think we have a key role to play in getting very specialist tools to work together and operate as a, as a coherent ecosystem. Yeah, I guess the one thing that I would add just to push that point a little further is that everybody already has a whole ton of tools. And mm -hmm. Each of them is their own little silos, their own little islands. What you can do in Ajiria is you can link those together, right? And now you can share and provide visibility across those islands, form those bridges, and get more value out of the investments that you've already made. Right? And so I think that's another important point. Yep. So I'm going to follow up on that. Has Open Bytes, Open Bytes is related to Open Lineage, it's in the same category. I'm looking at the landscape, AI a landscape right now. Why is it in the same category? What did this, what's the difference? Is it related? I don't know anything about Open Bytes, I'm afraid. <laughs> no. Mandy, do you know anything about Open Bytes? No, I've not heard of it. No. Um, so so Open Lineage is a, um, a set of events. It's like Open, I think it's Open Telemetry, is it based on? And it's just basically providing um, a standard set of event types that um, processing engines can emit to say this job ran, it, it worked on this data. Um, and that means that um, you, you, can, you can have um, capture tools that are watching how processing moves from one engine to another and actually trace the changes that are happening to data, even though there's lots of technology working on it. So in terms so of in certain terms of pipelines, things like I can't pronounce it, Amazon, 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 Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Yeah, and, and Data Hub are integral in terms of able to integrate. Yes. Lots of things. How does yeah, so Amundsen, so Amundsen and Data Hub and a number of others, they can all integrate with Ajiria, right, as peers. That's really what Ajiria enables, is somebody that has Amundsen over here and Data Hub over here and something else over there and, you know, some other vendor's product over here. Mm -hmm. You can link those together and, and they can be peers. And yeah, so if different, yeah, so if different teams prefer a particular tool, it's not a problem because um, their contributions can be shared with people using different tools. Right, and, and we often see, like, so Amundsen is geared very much for data science community, Data Hub, data science, and a little bit of data, more data engineering side, it gives you a little bit more visibility in that. You take some other tool, they, they go for a slightly different audience, and so different groups gravitate towards different tools, which is fine. As long, and, and the, but the critical missing piece is often the bridges that allow you to share and interchange that information. Yeah. Bring back, sorry, please go ahead. What, uh, what tips would you give, um, so if, if you are someone who has not a lot of influence in a large company that's been very siloed, um, and there's a lot of talk about um, data governance, you know, but there hasn't been a lot of movement, I see um, democratization of data as being core to this, mm -hmm. but silos, like an organization that's already been siloed, resist that idea, right. and usually it's for security reasons. How can the open source community like 
help with the democratization idea while also right. promoting security uh, around that data. So, Maddie, do you want to start or you want me to jump in or what? Um, I, all I, I mean, I, I, can, I can give you an example from Nigeria. So Nigeria operates in a peer-to-peer -peer way so that each silo can invest in their own tools. And the, the way the protocol works is that each team choose what they share and what they receive. Um, and that the security is done right at the instance level. So you can have two data sets in the same catalog. One is very secure, one is very open. So, um, and that, that's come from, you know, working with lots of different um, companies in different industries. So those types of requirements. Um, so I think because the, the technology is freely and easily available, different teams can download it, try it, build, bring confidence to it without needing a sales team and a demo platform and uh, special provisioning. Uh, so I think that that familiarity and ease of validation is uh, it help, helps in all the, with different parts of the organization to build trust in a particular solution. David, you have any idea? I was just thinking, we're right at the end here. So um, I wanted to thank you for coming and I would um, like you to think about contributing to our communities uh, and um, with Egeria and the Open Lineage ones being the, the big two that we're involved with. Um, bring your use cases, and if you want to help contribute, that would be fabulous. If you have, bring your use cases, bring your code contributions, and your enthusiasm, and help it, because this is a together thing. This is an, uh, an, uh, it's an open source thing all about community. It's not us versus another. It's, uh, we, we would like this to be an open source um, pr project that it brings people together. It's all about the integration. So, and that's what we think is most important. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there is one question that I just wanted to have a quick or one minute <laughs> fire, uh, fire type questions. So, so are there, what are the emerging trends in that ops? So I just wanted to quickly go through that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we have time. And so. Well, I mean, I'll just say that I think the, the thing with data ops is again, to embrace the innovation life cycle and leverage the open tools and the open integration that, that we're focused on. Yep. Any, any one sentence answer, from Andy? Um, no, no, nothing more, not in that time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are a lot more topics to discuss. You know, you heard about data mesh, data fabric, and all distributed yeah. data. There are a lot more things to discuss, but time is limited. But again, as uh, David was mentioning, Please join the community and then work towards now making the data as now as uh, uh, secure and, and have, as a reliable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if you have a GitHub account, please star our repositories um, because yep. the Linux Foundation loves that. Yep. And we'll be we'll stick around and answer any other questions. And there's yep. some yep. a curious mean, swag if you. Yeah. We've got hats we gifts for all <laughs> people who ask questions. Well, for everybody here, we've got hats and bottles for anybody that's interested and stickers. <laughs> if you're interested in any of them, those things, um, come up the front afterwards. And, and thank, thank you, my distinguished panelists here. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, David. And thank you all uh, for being uh, very interactively asking questions and then being participating in this session here. Okay, thanks. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.